Hey guys, we have yet another motherboard from ASUS and now we're heading down AMD's stack to the B650 motherboard. This is an ROG Strix B650A, which is the cheapest Strix in their lineup. Uh, this is obviously the AM5 motherboard for the 7000 series and above. As before, it supports DDR5. It doesn't actually support any PCIe Gen 5 uh, lanes, but we'll get to that a bit later on. Let me first talk a little bit about the chipset itself. B650 is currently the lowest chipset on the AM5 platform, with mostly PCIe Gen 4 lanes and less of them. But I don't think there's going to be a problem for most users. X670E can have up to 44 lanes with 24 of them PCIe Gen 5. On the other hand, B650 has only up to 36 lanes with zero of them in PCIe Gen 5. The actual direct CPU lanes can include an optional PCIe Gen 5 NVMe slot. Uh, this board is one of them. It actually includes that as well. Just like the rest of the lineup, they all support overclocking. And another notable difference is support for high-speed USB. The higher you go up the stack, the more fast ports you have. With that, let's check out what's inside the box. At the top, we have antenna, which is used for both Wi-Fi 6E as well as the Bluetooth 5.2 functionality. Below, we also have two SATA cables, thermal pads for the M.2, some spare M.2 Q latch and rubber packages, cable ties pack, as well as RG keychain and some stickers. With the motherboard out of the box, let's go through what you actually get. Zen 4 architecture currently has a glaring issue. It's its price. Not the CPU price or the motherboard price, but a combination of all the different components that make a system. I could almost say motherboard pricing can be justified because it doesn't just support two generations. Uh, AMD has promised to support multiple generations with this board. So that's, you know, can be justified to buy a slightly more expensive board as compared to Intel's focus boards. The problem here is memory support. Zen 4 no longer supports DDR4. What that means to the average user, if you're building up a new system, Yes, the DR5 is slightly more expensive right now, but you do potentially get some better performance. But if somebody's upgrading, they already have a DDR4 sticks. So it makes more sense just to kind of reuse that and kind of carry on using what you already have. The way that B650 addresses that issue is, it is a cut down version of the X670. In fact, the chipset in here is also in the X670, but that board actually contains two of them with slight changes, but that kind of the base is still here. So let's get into the specs of this particular board. And let's start specifically on the things which are connected directly to the CPU for maximum performance. So at the top right here, we have our Time16 slot, which is actually running PCIe Gen 4. And that's connected directly to the CPU. The nice thing about Zen 4, it actually has more PCIe lanes. Therefore, the top and the middle of NVMe slot are both connected to the CPU. With the top slots, as I mentioned earlier, some boards support PCIe Gen 5. This is one of them. So you actually get PC Gen 5 support on the top of NVMe and Gen 4 on the middle one. The other I.O. that connects directly to a CPU is actually at the back. So we have two video outputs. These connect directly to CPU. Two type A ports. These are 10 gigabits. One type C as well as this BIOS flashback. Um, and we'll come to cover those a bit later on. Going back to the front, we have two times one port down the bottom here, as well as a single times 16. This is actually wired up for only four lanes, but these four lanes are also shared with this NVMe drive down below. This is actually supporting up to 110 mil drive, but if you have this populated, this slot doesn't work and vice versa. So you have to choose which one you need. On the side here, we also have four SATA connections and for USB expansions, we have a USB Type-C expander right here, which is a 10 gigabit port, and USB Type-A, which is a 5 gigabit port. We also have two USB 2 ports down below, as well as a Thunderbolt connector. So you could utilize that for more connections. For cooling, we have seven fan headers. We have three up top, we also have one in the middle, and three down below. Uh, the other thing to consider is, these actually come with the little fan protectors. I've never seen these before, um, but they have little rubber tops on them to protect the cables. Um, for a fan header like this, in the middle of nowhere, it is reasonably easy to take it off. On the other hand, these ones, you essentially need to kind of catch them with your nail and like pull them out, so it's a bit harder. Once you got one of them out, the second one is a bit easier to take out, but it's not the most pleasant thing to do. Um, I'm hoping that uh, 
Asus finds a slightly better way to control this. To be honest, I've not really had any problems with bin pins on a fan header. Uh, not, not from just picking out the box and stuffing fans in there, but I assume Asus probably has a bit more research on this through the RMA, so maybe that is actually a big problem. Um, for me, I feel like if these kind of protectors are in place in a more fragile environment, you might actually do more harm than good, especially for people who have never built a PC before. So this is something to bear in mind. Um, talking about fragile connectors, um, we have four RGB headers. We've got two up top and two down below, three of which are actually ARGB, the Gen 2 version. Let's not forget some more RGB. Um, if you look over here, this ROG logo right here actually lights up. So you can control that for the software. So that's kind of nice as well. Let's now cover the IO at the back fully. We have two display outputs, which is HDMI 2.1, which supports up to 4K 60 Hertz, as well as display port 1.4, which supports 8K at 60 Hertz. Uh, below, we have four USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. Uh, they, these are the 10 gigabit ports. Uh, three of them are type A, with two of them at the tops, they're connected directly to the CPU, and the other one right here is connected to a chipset. The final port that's connected to the CPU, as I mentioned before, is the BIOS flashback. And that's very useful to have on a motherboard like this, which you will probably buy for the 7000 series right now, but then in the future you might want to resell it to somebody else who wants to buy 8000 or 9000 CPU, and they will need to be able to flash it without the CPU installed if they already have a newer CPU. This way it actually maintains the value of the board a bit higher, and it makes it easier for the next person to upgrade. Or if you're upgrading yourself and you want to troubleshoot some server problems, uh, flashing a BIOS just from a USB stick is a nice touch. Um, the other three USB 2 ports are connected directly to the chipset. Down below, we also have a 2.5 gigabit networking port. This is using an Intel chip, and we have Wi-Fi 6E. At the bottom, we also have 20 gigabit Type-C port, as well as five audio ports, should you wish to connect an audio system to this particular PC. Moving back to the front of the board, let's talk about ASUS specific features which make this a nicer purchase compared to some of the lower end motherboards um, from ASUS or other brands. The first DIY friendly feature is Q-Release, which helps remove PCIe slot expansions by just pressing the button on the side and removing the device out. The next one is Q-Latch, which makes it easy to add or remove M.2 drives without the need of fiddling around with small screws. The next one is QLED which is a nice feature to use when you're troubleshooting a system, for example, after a crash or when you've overclocked and you don't know what the problem is, whether it's memory or the CPU or both. And last one is BIOS Flashback. As I mentioned earlier, it's a great tool to update your BIOS without the need of the CPU inside your motherboard. That's about it for this motherboard. Realistically speaking, this is a cheaper alternative to the X670 board. It's not cheap, it is still on the more premium side, it is tricks after all, but you do get good connectivity and plenty of features that you could probably gonna utilize for the next two or three generations. Now, let us know what you think. Would you consider buying this board or is it price point is still too high for you? Um, I hope you found this useful. Don't forget to smash that thumbs up and subscribe for more. We'll see you guys in the next one.